Baragani, Jumbo, see Jumbo. How's everybody today? What's up, my netters? Glad to see you. Glad to uh, be here to present with you one more episode of Papa Al Kabalon here with Earth Mama. And uh, I'm glad to um, be able to, to talk about today the myths, the myth about myths. The myths about myths. So I'll just give you that, our outline today. So we got a we're going to start out with a little memorial to Brother Joe Browning. We're going to distinguish between what an, a myth is versus an allegory. We're going to talk about, I see I have it spelled wrong, the tortoise and the hare. Uh, Aesop of Fables, we're going to, we're going to, hmm. uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about nursery, nursery rhymes and how they apply to solar movements and, and different uh, astronomical things. We're going to talk about the Wizard of Oz today. What? The Wizard of Oz? Yes, the Wizard of Oz. We're going to talk about Harry Potter. What? That's right. And Christian mythology related to solar uh, and anatomy. We're going to look at the Lord's Prayer in the Ar Ar Aramaic language and look at the symbolism of Wasir, otherwise known as Osar, Asar, Osiris. Okay, so when we uh, think about myths, you know, people will say, oh, that's just a myth. You know, uh, you, you know, you tell them a story, oh, that's just a myth, or, you know, just different things like that. But this man here in the white suit uh, with, with the hat, with the stingy brim hat and the, and the glasses, this is Reverend Robertson. Reverend Robertson is like, I don't know, I guess young people would say gangster because he knew all about the scriptures and uh, he, he, could, he could break them down and he could, he could uh, tie them into the anatomy. And so he was like an early teacher for me when I first moved up here in Sacramento. And uh, this, is, this is an old picture of of the uh, Wose elders, these two on the end, Brother Bolton and Mother Spragans, they're now ancestors now. But Reverend Robertson, he's like 90. He's, well, I mean, he's, he's past 90. He's, he's actually closer to 100. But nobody really knew exactly how old he was because he wouldn't, he wouldn't let on. Anyway, there's Sister Valeria and, uh, and uh, Jimmy, and uh, Brother Hightower, Sister Phyllis Purvis, Grace Douglas, Queen Sheila, and Sister Noquasi. All right, so shout out to them for being a part of the original group of Wose elders. So gonna move on. So Reverend Robinson talked told me about some things and he, essentially what he said was that the Bible is about, the characters in the Bible about the sun, moon, and stars. He, he said if you want to understand it, you got you to gotta study astronomy and you got to study physiology. You got to know these things in order to know what they're talking about. So for instance, you know, and people call me this, I, I don't necessarily like it, but I just kind of go along with it. Being a minister at Wose Community Church, people refer to me sometimes as pastor, which implies that, you know, I'm uh, overseeing some sheep, which is farther from the, tr you know, you can't be any further than the truth from that with members of Wose Community Church, because these are, these are soul thinkers, these are mental thinkers, these are, these are conscious uh, African people striving, seeking for a higher understanding, knowledge, etc. So, but when you look at the word pastor, it, it actually means father star, father star, minister, moon star, minister Alicia. I know that you uh, uh, are, are really into the lunar cycles, and that's why I always refer to you as minister Alicia. And you, you don't know what I'm, what I'm thinking when I say that, but minister means moon star. And then you have young stars. 
You know, I don't even have to explain that. Young stars, they, they have the potential of being young stars. When you look at uh, like the planet, the, the planet Saturn, uh, the planet Saturn is the Lord of the Rings. It has rings around it and priests and ministers wear collars around their neck in honor of the planet Saturn. That's right. That's what that, that's what that ring around that neck means. It's referring to Saturn. Don't you think it's strange that the, that the Sabbath, which is the holy day, is supposed to be on the seventh day, which would be like the end of Friday going into Saturday? Saturday. Saturn. But, but it got changed by the Romans to Sunday. Monday is moon day. Tuesday is Mars day. Wednesday is Wooden's day or Odin's day. Thursday is Thor's day. So these things, uh, so we're talking about the myths of myths. And so I'm just, get, I'm just getting warmed up, uh, Earth, Earth Mama. Women wear earrings so that they can hear Saturn. We wear we wear a, a, a ring on our finger, on our third finger, for when we get married. You know, this is this is on a finger where it has a vein that goes straight to your heart. But you wear you wear your wedding ring in honor of Saturn. Let's look at the deck of cards. You know, many of us play play cards. Fifty two cards, number of weeks in a year. Twelve picture cards, number of months in a year. Four suits, number of seasons in a year. Thirteen cards in a suit, number of phases of the lunar cycle. So, uh, you know, we just kind of, the, the, the truth is before us, it's in plain sight, but we, we really kind of ignore it. We don't understand it. So I'm going to talk about the myths about myths. Puns, allegories, myths, and metaphors. All right. Firstly, I want to give uh, honor and praise, pour a libation to my brother, Joe Browning. Joe Browning uh, passed away a couple of years ago. And the first time I did this presentation, it was he had just passed. And so I livicated, not, de not dedicated, livicated this presentation to brother Joe Browning. Jo bro brother Joe Browning was a minister of a church of church and God in Christ, uh, but he would he would go to morning service, and then he would come. At, he would teach a Sunday school lesson, and then he would come to Wose and and worship and celebrate with us. He was just a tremendous brother. He was fighting health challenges. He was he was going to dialysis every day, and uh, but just a very strong person. Helped out his community helped out both churches. And, and one of the things that he was working on that he was not able to accomplish that hopefully we will be able to continue the work that he did. He wanted to start a tutorial program for math and sciences. And, and, and he, had, he had connected Wose, his, his church that he was going to, and, um, and Sac State, um, uh, different people at Sac State to, to put this tutorial program together. And so whenever we can bring it into fruition, bring it from the unmanifested state into the manifest state, we're going to call it the Browning Institute. So this, this presentation is livicated to Brother Joe Browning. So now, the word myth originates from the Greek word mythos, meaning word or tale or, or true narrative. Referring not only means to uh, by means of the way it was transmitted, but it's, but it's also the way that it's rooted in truth. Myths is closely related to emyo, uh, meaning to teach or to uh, initiate into the mysteries. And this is how it was interpreted by Homer, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now there's a difference between an allegory and a metaphor. So the main difference is that uh, an allegory, 
and a metaphor is an allegory is a piece of literature where characters, images, or e events act as symbols. Whereas a metaphor is a literary device that makes a comparison between two unrelated things. An allegory is sometimes classified as an extended metaphor. So I found this little piece here and it kind of gives us allegory versus metaphor. Allegory is a piece of literature. I already said that. Allegory, allegory acts as a hidden meaning to a text. Metaphor compares to unrelated things. Allegory uses symbol, symbolism. Metaphor uses imagery. Allegories have a hidden meaning which relates to a moral, or mor which relate to morality or politics. And uh, a metaphor uh, does not have a hidden meaning. So first one I want to tackle, and uh, this, uh, this I have to give credit again. I was listening to Miss Mariana and her uh, morning, um, what does she call them? Morning sunrise uh, musings or whatever. She, if you're Facebook friends with her, she wrote a book called Own Your Own Shit. And uh, I forgot what that S-H-I-T stands for, but it, it has a very... Uh, higher meaning, but the, but when you say it, it's own your own shit, which it really means be responsible for your own thing. Well, anyway, she gives these talks, and she made reference to the tortoise and the hare. Now, the tortoise and the hare, uh, you know, I used to, I, I grew up on Warner Brothers um, uh, cartoons, and so this is where you see the tortoise and the hare in the Aesop's Fables. Now, the tortoise and the hare really represents the earth and the moon. So the tortoise is represented by the earth, the hare is represented by the moon, and the race of the tortoise and the hare represents the respective rev revolutionary movements of the two bodies. The hare, as the moon, is fast. It completes a revolution around the earth in 30 days. In the fable, the hare is depicted as literally running circles around the tortoise. So, but the earth is much slower, completing its revolution in 365 and a quarter days. But what do we find in the documented fable? The hare in its overconfidence decides to take a short nap, falls short of the finish line, while the tortoise continues to plod along and continues until he crosses it. And what this re is referring to is that, so astronomically, the finish line is the completion of the 365 days. The lunar calendar, whether it's 354 days or 364 days, falls short of the complete year. Thus, the hare does fall short of the finish line while the tortoise crosses it. Lending weight to this interpretation is the circular construction on their uh, race course. So, read astronomically, Aesop was preserving a record of the official establishment in, tic of, in antiquity of the solar year. So, you know, first there was the stellar year that went on the stellar movements, 360 days or 360 uh, you, you know, 360 degrees. And then they went, they wanted to make a more accurate calendar. Then they went to 354 days, the, the, the lunar calendar. And, you know, uh, you and I would not be here if it were not for the moon, because the moon regulates the cycle of your mom and causes, you know, her, uh, you, you know, to ovulate at a, at, a, at a specific time and all, all of these things. So we are, we are closely connected to the earth. We're closely connected to the, to the moon. We're closely connected to the sun. I don't care what people write about, you know, different things and different scriptures. These are just some hard facts that you can't get around. So uh, I, I got most of this information just uh, on this from uh, Dr. Charles Finch's book, Star of Deep Beginning, and it's part of the Journal of African Civilizations as, as um, 
uh, put out by uh, Dr. Ivan Van Serma. So when I was growing up, this is how Aesop appeared. You know, they you know used to watch the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. Where is Moose and Squirrel? All those, all those things. No, uh, Boris and and Natasha, you know, all that. You know, which we're back to that. Natasha's in, in the White House. You know, yep. she, that's that's Trump's wife, Natasha. You know, just so. But you know, this is this is the way they depicted Aesop and his and his son. You know, this is they would they would have some little tranquil music. You know, they would say Aesop, and then he would he would get a jackhammer and put and son. So the guy would just just throw up his hands like, okay, that's my boy. But really, Aesop was an African. He was an Ethiopian. That's right. He was an Ethiopian. And Aesop is actually a version of the word Ethiopia. He was described as having dark skin, wide nose, a stutter, which would indicate that he uh, had a foreign accent. You know, his his fables are on animals, uh, not Greek animals, but animals from Africa, apes, lions, crocodiles, elephants, jackals, lions, monkeys, etc. Now, uh, how, how do I find out? How did I find out that Aesop was an African? Uh, by this man here, J.A. Rogers. Uh, you need to get J.A. Rogers' books. He has World's Great Men of, Vo World's Great Men of Color, Volume 1 and 2. Uh, you know the title is is a little misleading because he has he has women in there as, as well. Great women, Hapset Shoot, Queen Ty, um, you know uh, all great women that that are uh, in history. Queen Anne and Zinga, all of, all of the people are are in his uh, book. So if you want to like know some African history, and he has a lot of different thumbnail sketches that are just really jam-packed with uh, references and facts. You should get World's Great Men of Color. He also wrote, um, he also wrote Nature Knows No Color Line, Volume 1, 2, and 3, uh, Sex and Race, Volume 1, 2, and 3. And, and I love this picture that he has in Sex and Race. I like, I like this one because so he has this in Sex and Race, Volume 1. And these are pictures from National Geographic going back 19... 1928, uh, and, and, and so he, 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 so look at these pictures. Now, you and I look at, looking at these pictures, these are black people, these are African people. As a matter of fact, you see, see this queen, this is a queen from Rwanda. And, and uh, you, so, some people have these hook heads in Africa. And you know, you can see this in the Akhenaten statues and, and his family. Actually, you know what? I went to school with Hook. You know, uh, you, you know, there were there were kids that had that that head, and we would call them Hook. And sometimes, if you weren't born that way, they would tie your head up and, and shape it that way. But the caption underneath, you know, that that um, J. A. Rogers has what it says. It says the Ethiopians have pronounced Semitic features: kinky hair, thick lips but otherwise not Negroid, that these people aren't black. See, this is why we have, this is why I'm talking to you. Hey, Emma, talking to you now. This is why we have this, because our history, our history is clouded. They're, they're doing the five-card Monty on us. Sisters and brothers, those of you that know that. So just going on. Remember that book you just said that, that you could find it in? Uh, yeah. world, world's uh, oh so that was sex and race sex and volume race. one sex and race volume one so now uh jay rogers he was born in september 6th i know so many people born in september 6th uh from from the grill jamaica and he died in in 1966 in new york he was a historian he was a journalist he was an author uh, whose works made great contributions to the history of Africa and its diaspora. He financed his studies on a Pullman Porter's uh, salary. He was a Pullman Porter, he and so he and so he wrote books, traveled to various places, libraries, etc., gaining firsthand uh, knowledge of the things that he wrote about. So he's the one that told me about. 
not personally, but by reading his books uh, about Aesop. So when he goes, so, uh, and then uh, there's this woman. She kind of looks like Rebecca Davis uh, here in, in uh, Sacramento. I ran this by Rebecca a few years ago, and I, I showed her that picture. She said, yeah, that looks like me. She, well, she wrote this book, not Rebecca, but Drusilla, Drusilla Dungy Houston wrote this book, Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire. And uh, it, it is jam-packed with the Arabian Nights. Uh, you know, uh, Arabia was originally a black country, particularly the area referred to as Arabia Felix. So really, Arabia is divided into two areas, uh, Arabia Deserta, the desert, and Arabia Felix, the happy, which is where the black people were, which is where matriarchy was. Do you not know that the pilgrimage to Mecca was already in place a thousand years before the birth of Muhammad, that people were already coming there, and that, that Kaaba stone, that black meteorite, came from Ethiopia and was, and was given and put there in, in, uh, in, in the place now that's called Mecca. So uh, she wrote a, she gives, her book is jam-packed with a whole lot of information. So, so um, you know, She's an American writer, historian, educator, a journalist, musician, and a screenwriter from West Virginia. Uh, born in 1876, died in 1941. And this is what she said about Aesop. She says, Africans tell many stories like those of Aesop. Many, names cl many nations claim Aesop. This is because he was a Kushite, of which there were all divisions. So by identity of race, he belonged to all of them. Tradition says that he was black and deformed. Now sometimes, just having black features make other people say that these people are deformed. But again, you know, and I said this uh, the last time we met, that the ancient Greeks said the Ethiopians were the most handsomest and most just of men. It is very likely that he was part, that that uh, that he was part of that part of his life was spent in Alexandria and the cities of Asia Minor. Now, uh, this is the way that the Greeks portrayed the Greeks and the Romans portrayed Ethiopians. You know, and that you know people think that Bob Marley started locks, but people were doing locks in the ancient times. Actually, I want to do. A, a, a program, a session on just locks, so, you know. So anyway, so see see the way that we used to be portrayed, you know. And and we don't like these features now, you know. Uh, these 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 features are repugnant to us because we've been brainwashed. All right, moving on. Now I want to talk about the nursery rhymes and and. You know, when my children were growing up, we would read them the Fred Crump Jr. Uh, version of the nursery rhymes. So Fred, and this is a, this is a, a, a slide here with, with uh, some of his works. He wrote one, the, uh, the Ebony Duckling, the uh, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, Sleeping Beauty, Rapunzel, all of those. Well, the first one he calls Ebonita and the Seven Boys. Ebonita and the Seven Boys. You know, I had to do something. We had to do something. Me and my wife, we had to do something because we needed... Our, our children, sisters and brothers, are like the golden child. Remember that movie, The Golden Child? And, and one of the things that they say in The Golden Child is that the child must be surrounded by evil on all sides so that it will not project out and, and you know, and escape the slavery, and, and, you know, and, and so this is where our children. So we had to find things, and, and fortunately, our children grew up in the '90s, and and these uh, things were available. So thank you, Fred Crump Jr. But getting on to Snow White, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is Snow White is the sun as a beautiful white aura, and the different undifferentiated colors of the sun is one light that gets differentiated into seven lights 
which are referred to in the seven chakras. And then there's Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood is the sun. As the sun sets in the western horizon, the ancients always placed the scales of Libra in the western sunset, where from time to time the sun sets with red colors. The scales of Libra begin at the horizon and then go down 30 degrees below the horizon. When Mama tells Little Red Riding Hood, don't stop, see anybody, you've got to go direct. So, so, and that's what the sun does. It doesn't stop, it just goes direct. And out of the seven planets in the sky that we can see visibly, the sun is the only one that does that. Now, within uh, the, the constellation of Libra, you have these different, um, what they call decons. Okay, you know, you think you're deacon in the church. No, it's referring to something astronomical. These are, these were called deacons. And one of the ones is lupus. So along comes the wolf. The wolf is, is lupus, one of the deacons of Libra where the sun sets every day and is always on the horizon. So when Little Red Riding Hood comes out of the other side of the horizon, She's saved by Orion and lives to see another day. Uh, Sleeping Beauty. Um, so Sleeping Beauty is the earth goddess. In the myth of Sleeping Beauty, the earth goddess sinks into her long winter sleep when pricked by the point of the spindle. In her cosmic palace, all is locked up in icy repose, not thriving save the ivy which defies the coal until the kiss of the golden-haired sun reawakens life and activity. See, it gives us a higher meaning, a higher way of thinking about these things. And these things were preserved in, in myths, so-called fairy tales, so that we could still have the astronomical information. So uh, Cinderella and Prince Charming, it's the same as as um, um, you, you know, it's it's the same as 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 the other story about Sleeping Beauty. It's just it's, it's just the names are changed. Uh, four and and twenty blackbirds uh, has to do with four and twenty hours in a day. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna drill down on that, but four and twenty blackbirds, twenty hours in a day. The pie that holds them is the underlining earth, the 24, the four and 20 blackbirds are the 24 hours. The, uh, and, uh, you, you know, so anyway, when, when, it, when uh, the day breaks, then the birds begin to sing. And you know, that's true in nature. So these are just astronomical things. You know, Reverend Robertson was right. You know, these things are just about the sun, moon, and stars. Did you have a question? You no, you're doing great. Oh, okay. So I'm going to keep going. There's a there's a second part on Little Red Riding Hood. So she's the evening sun, which is always described as red or golden. The old grandmother is the earth to whom the rays of the sun brings warmth and comfort. The wolf, which is a well-known figure for the clouds and the blackness of night, is the dragon in another form. First, he devours the grandmother. That is, he wraps the earth in thick clouds, which is the evening sun, which the evening sun is not strong enough to pierce through. Excuse me. Then, with the darkness of night, he swallows up the evening sun itself, and all is dark and desolate. And then, the the huntsman comes in the morning and kills the wolf, which is the which is the darkness. And then. Uh, Little Red Riding Hood and the, and the grandmother get to live again. Wow. Jack and the Beanstalk. I'm just not a beauty and the beast. All of these are the sun, moon, and stars. And this is the Fred Fred Crump Jr. collection. So, so who is Fred Crump Jr.? So I'm glad you asked that. Fred Tr Crump Jr. was born in Houston, Texas. In 1931, he received a master's degree in art from Sam Houston College in 1961. He moved to Palm Springs, California, taught art at a, at a junior high for 32 years. After retiring from his teaching career, he began 
a career as an author and illustrator of children's books in addition to teaching, writing, and illustrating. So Mr. Crump also wrote for magazines such as Humpty Dumpty, Playmate, and Turtle. Uh, Mr. Crump brought the fairy tales of childhood to African American children in a way which they can person personally identify. He died. Uh, he joined the ancestors and on, oh, actually, we're coming up on his birthday, October 29th, wow. 2005, at the age of 72. I, you know what, I looked for his picture and I found a picture of a black man, but I don't think that was him. There, uh, unfortunately, there's no pictures of Fred Crump Jr. that I could find. Now we're going to talk about the Wizard of Oz. And I remember when the Wizard, you know, I, 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 I use the, I'm using the uh, African characters. I'm using the characters from the Wiz. And I remember when the Wiz came out. It was, came out, it came out the same time that Frankie Beverly and Mays had that song, Joy and Pain. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, reading a review about this and uh, what the reviewer said, the only thing that stood out in this movie were the veins in Diana Ross's neck. What? <laughs> I thought that was funny. You know, because <laughs> Diana Ross, she's a 40-year-old woman playing like, yeah, a, like, like a teenager. Yeah, yeah, you know, so, right. so that's, that's why that was funny. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so now, what the Wizard of Oz is talking about is popularism in the 1890s. It was written by this guy named Baum. Uh, Baum. And uh, so it, it has, there's symbolic, you know, everything is symbolic in this in, in this book. So the cyclone, the famous slipper, even Toto. And so there's a central populist message and it has to do with the gold standard versus the silver standard. And, uh, you know, it has to do with 19th century populism uh, primarily with uh, rural farmers. So, so now, so Dorothy, Diana Ross, I actually like her daughter in Blackish, by the way. Uh, you know, I, I, I think she's funny, okay. Um, that's just me. So in The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy is an orphan living in Kansas, a dull gray place that has lost its vibrancy. So according to historian Quentin Taylor, Dorothy represents each of us at our best, kind but self-respecting, guileless but level-headed, uh, wholesome but plucky. <laughs> plucky. I wouldn't use that word, but, you know, that's what it is. <laughs> In short, she's the girl next door. She represents the average American looking for a solution to her simple problem. So in the 1880s and 1890s, the state of Kansas was going through a terrible time. Uh, droughts, harsh winters, invading grasshoppers, uh, scorched the prairie, devastated farmers blamed all sorts of forces, Wall Street, the railroads, politicians, or nature itself. In fact, the tribulations of America's farmers give rise to the populist movement, which promised Solutions, You know, that's what happens. There's a lot of promises in politicians, uh, uh, you know, among politics, as, as the Rastas say. Um, what's that called? There's Bob Marley wrote a song called Revolution, and in there he says, Never make a politician grant you a favor. They mm. will always want to control you forever. Wow. You know. So Bob, Bob was a poet. I, I'd like to do a, a, a thing on him, but you know, that's been done so much, so I'm, I'm not gonna do it. So <laughs> the Wizard of Oz contains coded symbolism that supported uh, popularism. Now, Michael Jackson was the scare, scarecrow. And the scarecrow represents Midwest farmers. The scarecrow is convinced that he doesn't have a brain. Uh, the, uh, you know, and that, you know, everything is in doubt, etc. you know, but he finds out that he, that he does. And then the tin man, he's the mistreated factory worker. You know, in the 1890s, the U.S. was in the middle of an industrial revolution that shifted a lot of workers from being, uh, treat, uh, you, you know, they weren't treated well by their bosses. Uh, he represents dehumanized worker. 
which is literally turned into a ten by the wicked witch of the east. The ten was once a strong, healthy worker. The ten man, he was once a strong, healthy worker. But after the witch cursed him, he accidentally chops off his own limbs and each is replaced with ten, transforming him into a ten man. So again, he represents the factory worker who has lost their heart in the new economy. And the symbolism goes e even deeper. The tin man is rusted when Dorothy meets him, paralleling the high unemployment during the depression of the 1890s. But he's ready to work as demonstrated as Dorothy just gives him a few drops of oil and then he gets, gets unclogged again. Now, the lion uh, he uh, represents a, a populist by the name of uh, William Jennings Bryan. And William Jennings Bryan, sometimes he was represented as a lion in the media. You know, he ran for president a few times. He didn't make it. He promoted the silver uh, currency movement, arguing that the gold standard were, was harming the farmers. <coughs> you know, but he never was able to accomplish his goal, and so he was portrayed as a cowardly lion. Then, now we come to the silver slippers. Now, in the movie, it was, it was the ruby slippers. And that, they put that in there because, you know, they, they had just started using Technicolor in movies, and so they changed it from silver, but it actually had to do with the silver movement that was so so it was silver and she was walking on the yellow brick road which was the gold standard and this is what the farmers wanted to return to free silver to protect them from economic harm caused by the gold standard the wicked witch represented uh you, you know uh, uh uh the 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 uh the big money interests in the East. So the Wicked Witch of the East, <laughs> this is kind of a funny picture, uh, you know, so she represented, the, she represented Wall Street, you know, that, that were no friends of the uh, farmer. And then the Wicked Witch of the West, she symbolizes the bankers, the railroad owners, wealthy oil men, J.D. Rockefeller, etc. cetera. So, uh, so, being dissolved by water is being dissolved by the monetary debate over liquidity. What are you mm -hmm. going to say? What are you going to say something? No, no, no. Could you get to what about the little munchkins? So the the munchkins. <laughs> okay, let me let, let me just so skip cute. to the munchkins. Okay. All right. So, so uh, the Emerald City is is uh, Washington D.C. Okay. You know the Emerald City is Washington D.C. Uh, and uh, the the wizard is the presidency. You know, he claims to be great and powerful, but he's actually a charlatan. What better example wow. than what we have today? He's a bumbling old man hiding behind a facade of paper mache and noise, making him any president from Grant to McKinley. But as we know now, there were more that, that followed him, you know. Uh, so the Munchkins. I have something on here in the Munchkins. I think they under the the Wicked Witch. I thought I seen that. Did you see that? Yeah, right okay, under the the Wicked that. Witch. All right, uh, and, what, and the what? Flying Monkeys. Oh, the Flying Monkeys are are the Plains Indians, the Plains Indians that they, you know, the guy who wrote this book was in favor of genocide against the Indians. Whoa. Yeah. So uh, right, he he he. So. He says, we were a free people living happily. See, see, see the, the monkeys say in that movie, we were free, we used to live happily before the wicked witch, you know, flying from tree to tree, eating nuts. But all that changed when the, when the Oz came and ruled over us. Wow. I'm still, yes, 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 yes. Oh, one more. Uh, right there, the third one. Okay, so. The third doc, we just took the wicked east to slay the monsters. Yeah, so, 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 oh. so, so they, they were enslaved, you know, so. Uh, you. Uh, 
it, there's so much to this. I'm just, I'm just giving you a thumbnail sketch. I'm just going to move on from there. You can look that up. Uh, that's your homework for, for, the, for this week. Now I'm going to go to Harry Potter. Now I want to just pause for a minute. My son was in the sixth grade. My oldest son, uh, Ra, Rahotep Anu, was in the second grade when this book came out. And he was an avid reader. He bought the book and he read right through it. He was in competition with, a, with a, 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 one of his classmates uh, in the second grade by the name of Evan Hirano. They were trying to see who could read the book first. I love this competition that they had because it developed his reading skills, but he began to read and he started talking about Sirius Black and it, and it seemed like Sirius Black was the bad guy. So my wife said, you know what? I'm gonna need to buy that book and read along with him. And then we found out, okay, Sirius Black was not the bad guy, but uh, she began to have an appreciation for it. And, and they would wait for the next book to come out and they would read it. And, and it, was a, it was a beautiful thing between a mother and son, you know, Harry Potter. But the Harry Potter is actually related to the alchemical marriage of the Rosicrucians. The Rosicrucians are a Masonic order their, their headquarters is here in California in uh, San Jose and it's referred to as the Rosy Cross or the Rosicrucian Order. And so all of these characters uh, have a meaning in Harry Potter. So Harry represents the new or immortal soul. Hermione Granger is the new mind of the alchemist. Ron Weasley, the earthly biological personality. Albus Dumbledore, the radiant, the radiation from God, the Gnosis, the divine spirit, Rubius Hagrid, the Bodhisattva, the gatekeeper bringing seekers to the path. And those, those of you that uh, know what a Bodhisattva is, a Bodhisattva is a person who has gained enlightenment. And when people gain enlightenment, they just want to move on to the next phase. They don't want to necessarily stay here on this three dimension three-dimensional plane of, of existence. But a bodhisattva takes a vow that he's going to remain here, he or she are, is going to remain here and help raise the consciousness of people and help raise the consciousness of humankind. Uh, Lily Potter, the divine spark in the heart. James Potter, the longing for God. Voldemort, Voldemort the immortal but sinful higher nature of the human macrocosm. Sirius Black, the living plan of God. The Weasley family is the seven chakras associated with the uh, endocrine glands. Neville Lumbottom is the medulla oblongata. Mm. Severus Snape, the black side of the personality. Uh, 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 Remus uh, Lupin, the gray side of the personality. Um, Draco Malfoy, the serpentine fire in the, in the spinal cord. Crab and Goyle, the left and right uh, string of the sy sympathetic nervous system. Uh, uh, Narcissus Malfoy, the physical body. Lucius Malfoy, the brain and its feeling of superiority. Dopey, the liberated ethereal body. Creature, the remnant of the old earth earthly etheric body. Uh, Twelve, a uh, Grunwald place, the remnants of the old earthly part of the Mac microcosm and the snitch is the divine the new divine consciousness so if you read Harry Potter with this symbolism in mind the story will transform from being an exciting battle between good and evil to a method of absolute liberation from death suffering and evil all right moving on have uh, how much time do I have should I make this a two-parter you probably should should I just stop right there? No, and, and give us, give us, give us, give us, give us. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So the sun and Christmas. So you know that December 22nd, excuse me, December 21st is the shortest day of the year. The sun is said to have died, and then it goes and stays down here. It goes to this constellation call, which is referred to as the Southern Cross, which means it's crucified on the Southern Cross. And then after the, after lying in the in the grave for three days 22nd 23rd and 24th 
it rises and is reborn on December 25th. And also associated with the story is the star in the east and the three wise men. The star in the east is Sirius. And the three wise men and, and Orion's belt, the, the stars are pointing to Sirius. All right. So now that's the astronomical part, but there's also a physiological anatomical part wherein Joseph is the pineal gland. Mary is the pituitary gland. The Red Sea is the spinal column. And so what happens is that in the claustrum, which is up here in the brain, it forms a secretion, the spinal, beautiful spinal fluid, and it travels down the spinal cord, goes down to below to the sacrum, the sacred sacrum, and then begins to travel up. And how many, how many, how many uh, vertebrae are there? Thirty-three vertebrae. How many years did Jesus spend on Earth? Thirty-three years. And it goes, and it gets when it gets up here and crosses the medulla oblongata, going up into the pineal gland. It's crucified, which means it's, it's magnified a thousand times. And then what happens is unused neurons turn on and then you become enlightened. So, uh, you know, the early Christians knew this. Uh, and uh, they, they kept this story alive in the in the Christ story. So what happens is, at beginning at age 12, a seed is formed by the secretions of the pineal and the pituitary gland, the milk and the honey. They form the seed and it, and it, and it is born in the solar plexus around the stomach area or Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. And then that seed goes mm. down to the sacred plexus, to the, to, to the, to the, to the sacred, sacral plexus. I'm having a hard time uh, pronouncing these words today. And it goes <laughs> down, and then it, it makes the path back up through proper breathing, abstaining from sex during the time that you are... Uh, the, during the time that so when the moon is in the the sign that your sun sign was born in it stays in there for two or three days so you're you're to abstain from sex during that time because it's going to mess with the seed also drinking alcohol kills the seed so i mean you could drink alcohol i mean you know i'm not i'm not going to clown that but you know it has a consequence and you only get 12 seeds a year. Wow. And that's called eating of the tree of life. Wow. All right. So I verified this next slide, and I got the verification maybe an hour before I came here. Now, I've always seen this picture, and this is found in the Holy of Holies in the Grand Lodge of Luxor in Kemet. And here, what's, what's being shown is the Annunciation. So the mother is, is announced that she's going to have a holy child. And then she's impregnated. You know, see, they're showing, they're, they're giving the breath of life to her nostrils through the onks. And this, this uh, Neturu on the left is Kanum. He's known as the potter. And so he molds people on his potter's wheel. This is before T.D. Jakes. Mm. And then you have Het Haru or Hat Thor. She's, she's representing the feminine side. They're, so the masculine and the feminine is, is impregnating the mother. And then she's on the birthing chair giving birth 
And then the child is born with all this adoration. This is found in the Holy of Holies in, in ancient Kemet. So I had to verify this. So I, I went to my go-to brother, uh, Muhammad Fahmy. And I said, I said, hey, Fahmy, do you know if this is really... Because when I was there in, in, in Luxor, I didn't see this. But there's so much there. And we were there at night. And so I didn't see this. And I forgot to ask him about it. And I, I wanted to verify this, and so he said, "Yeah, this is in this is in uh, this is also." He said, "This is in in um, in Luxor, but he said it's also in um, in um, the Temple of Dendera." And he asked me for a better copy, you know, because he was trying to read the cartouches in there to see who it is. I mean, you know, so he's he's very uh, proficient in Medunetcher, so. You, you know, what I'm trying to tell you is this story is a lot older than what people say. Now, you know, Jesus didn't speak English. Mary didn't speak English. They didn't speak French. They didn't speak Latin. They didn't speak German. They didn't speak Russian. What were they speaking? They were speaking Aramaic. Now, he probably spoke Hebrew, I'm sure he did, and Greek. But he, like, most likely, the common language that he was speaking is Aramaic. So, you know, historians, you know, talk about that was the colloquial language at the time in that area. Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, you know, Judea. That's what they were speaking. They were speaking Aramaic. So, in Aramaic, and I'm not going to try to read. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on trying to say the Aramaic, the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic, but I'm not there yet. But the translation says, O cosmic birther, from whom the breath of life, your heavenly domain approaches, let your will come true in the universe, all that vibrates just as on earth. That is material and, and dense. Uh, detach the fetters of false that bind us, karma, like we let go of the guilt of others. Let us not be lost in superficial things, materialism, uh, common temptations. But let us be free from uh, that all that is evil. This is, you know, what if we had that in mind as we're saying the Lord's Prayer? Now you can find this on this, the, the NazareneWay.com, Lord's Prayer, underscore dot htm. Wasir, the Wasirian drama. Now, this is, uh, you know, we say, you know, what's the 21st uh, Psalm? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Here's the rod and staff right here and this is how you would write wasir in medunetra or suf language notice that it includes the throne which which is his part of his wife name she she represents the throne so to write his name you have to include the one now why is uh wasir painted green now I want you to I want you to pay close attention to you see this he's he's got an X on he's wet you know it's X and it looks like little stars or rubies in it this is this is part of the uh, what do you what would you call that regalia these are the vestments you know he's got the he's got the um, you know and a lot of Africans even today I have a picture of Nelson Mandela he has this kind of ring around his neck might might re relate to Saturn uh, might relate to the light body I'm going to keep going I'm not going to get into why he was green basically he represents fertility but see this X was used in American icons here's, here's Washington with an X and he's kneeling like they used to do in Kemet you know, so like um, uh, Colin Kaepernick, 
kneeling down because of the uh, racist uh, attacks on black people by, by the police in this country because of the police brutality, recognizing that the third verse in the Star Spangled Banner is, re is referring to slavery. So he's actually going, he actually just went ancestral. And here, here are the Neturu with the Per'ah, and they're taking an oath. And here, Washington is doing the same thing. It's got the X in the background. And that X, you can see it in the mummies. You can see it on the cross of St. George, England, the cross of St. Andrew, Scotland, cross of St. Patrick, Ireland. Look at the Union Jack. And the and the mummies right, mummies wrappings right. And see, racists they can't even get their own symbols. I was watching, I was watching uh, Rush Hour two, and uh, the way Rush Hour two opens up, um, you know, Chris Tucker and uh, Jackie Chan they're leaving L.A. and they're going to Hong Kong, and 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 when they when their when their plane goes over the island of Lantau near Hong Kong, there's this giant Buddha statue that's as big as a mountain. And you know Buddha, he's he's got nappy hair, which we don't like, uh, black people, because we do everything that we can to 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 do away with that. And you know what's around his neck? A swastika. A swastika, Queen Mother. Earth mama, a swastika. So racists, they can't even get their own symbols. Here, they're taking my symbols. They're taking, they're taking my ancestor symbol to use it to oppress me. Well, now they always say the South shall rise again. Here was seer. He's got an erect penis. Because a lot of times, brothers, when the sun rises, you rise too. And here, Kepper, the bringer into being, brings this into being. And here's the sun, moon, and stars. But when we look at the right triangle, we see the same thing. They're just doing math among other things. It's thematic. All right? And then, now I got this from Astro Quasi. I, I have to give credit why credit is due. Brother Astro Quasi, he, uh, he made a video uh, back a while. It's called African Origin of Masonic Order, and he includes that. So if you, look at the, if you look at the penis, and you look at the X, and look at the Cairo symbol, you see where it comes from. It's putting things together. All right. And sometimes what well, Sears referred to as Winnis. Most people say Unas, but the great uh, indigenous wisdom keeper of Dal Hakim Awiwan Awiyan says Winnis. So this is so this is in, in the uh, nameplate of cartouche, Winnis. And here are some references that I'm not going to go into. So, in conclusion, we did a memorial to Brother Joe Browning. We talked about the differences between myth and allegory. I spelled tortoise wrong in this. There's the tortoise and the hare. Uh, we talked about Aesop, Aesop's fables, who Aesop was. We talked about nursery rhymes re related to the solar myths. Looked at the Wizard of Oz and the 1890s populist movement. We looked at Harry Potter and the alchemical marriage. We looked at the Christian myth related to solar and anatomy. We looked at the Lord's Prayer from an Aramaic perspective. See, this is what happened. You and I, I heard Dr. Um, I heard Dr. Um, uh, Amos Wilson say, we are not Africans, but we're possessed by spirits and demons. And when we, and when we speak, it is not with the African voice, it is with the voice of that demonic presence who uses our lips to speak its own language. Hmm. This is why we need to strive 
to learn our languages. Strive to learn Wala. Strive to learn Kikoyu. Strive to learn Kiswahili. Some people say, well, Kiswahili is an African language. It's got Kiswahili, the, ba the root of it is Bantu. Root of it is Bantu, which is another allusion to the Kemetic, the, the, the um, Medu nature, the Suf language, because Banatu, the Ba, so it means it, it's referring to the people, the soul people. Anyway, I got off on that. So we need, so the same way that, that you know, our language was taken by Europeans from Western Europe. The people in the in the so-called Middle East, their language was taken over. They they were speaking Aramaic, but then some people came in and and had them speaking Greek, had them speaking Latin. They changed. Actually, it was an African that that made uh, Latin the official language of of the uh, of the of the Catholic Church. It was uh, Tertullian. Anyway. Moving on, and so the last thing we talked about was the symbolism related to Wasir, Asar, or Osiris. And so, with that, I don't know if I went over time. I'm sorry if it, I'm sorry if we uh, I'm sorry if we went a little long. I know that I I encompass a lot of things, but but I was just on fire. I wanted to talk about the myths of myths. Hopefully, you got something out of it. This is. Papa Al Kabalan signing off. Uncle Job Saneb, life, prosperity, and health. Live up.